So I don't generally love hit pieces. I really don't. But here we are. And do we need another hot take on campus protests in the United States? Probably not. But there's so much historical inaccuracy in the coverage that we see right now that maybe we need just one more. UNFTR. So what happens next? We got graduations coming soon, or not. Student protests will turn to street protests in the hot summer months leading up to the Democratic Convention in the dead of August in Chicago. With the war raging overseas and tensions between generations and races boiling over here at home. Oh, and there's even a Robert Kennedy in the running again. So we're running back more than the Trump versus Biden election. We're running back 1968. And the question has to be asked, what have we learned? So I've been involved in several conversations about campus protests lately with people regurgitating some pretty gnarly talking points that appear to be disseminated through mainstream media, amplified through social media, and anchored in echo chamber conversations. If your conversations are anything like mine, they're typically derailed by specific examples designed to portray global meaning. Here's what that sounds like. Did you see the video of insert confirmation bias example here? What do you say to that? Or any sentence that starts with, you know, a lot of people are saying, and the ever popular and annoying, there was an article the other day, I, I can't remember where I read it, but you know, basically it says the exact opposite of what you're telling me right now with all your facts and figures. So let's do some really basic level setting before we take a detour to show an example of a gish gallop argument designed to manufacture consent, or to say it more plainly, a bunch of establishment talking head bullshit designed to confuse something pretty straightforward. First of all, in spite of the breathless media coverage of pro-Palestine campus protests, the figures are astonishingly small. Now, I'm not talking about small student demonstrations or clubs that have organized on campuses to discuss the rights of Palestinians. I'm speaking to the high-profile campus encampments that have captured the headlines, several of which have already been dispersed. For example, there have been about 2,300 arrests on 44 campuses nationwide. A few protest groups reached agreements with college and university administrations and voluntarily broke down their encampments. And a couple have had brutal police crackdowns and aggressive counter-protests. At the peak, Axios reported that there were 59 full-on campus protests in the United States. And according to the Los Angeles Times, those 44 that came to loggerheads with the police are pretty much breaking down. So as I've said before, there are 4,000 university campuses that offer degrees in the United States. So even the most generous interpretation reveals that 1.4% of college campuses had a sustained protest movement. For comparison's sake, after the Kent State Massacre at the hands of the National Guard in 1970 and Nixon's invasion of Cambodia, protests erupted on more than 1,300 campuses. Not to mention about 500 schools were just shut down by strikes and direct actions. So in 1970, there were about 3,000 higher education institutions. So that means that more than a third of them were disrupted by protests and one sixth of them were shut down. So let's clear up a couple of other misconceptions. Free speech is protected in nearly every form on public university campuses, period. Speech, hate speech, signs, sit-ins, strikes, shutdowns. There are nuances, but that's pretty much the deal. Private colleges, on the other hand, are not subject to the same rules protecting speech. So in this way, it's like the ongoing debate about free speech on social media platforms. Private institutions set the rules and the burden is really high when it comes to exercising speech outside of the stated rules and the norms of the institutions. Protest on the sidewalk outside of a private school and you're good to go. Do it on campus grounds and you should probably pack a toothbrush your ID, a change of underwear, and a granola bar, because you might wind up in a holding cell. With that out of the way, a clarification regarding hate speech is in order. You are allowed to say whatever the fuck you want to say in the United States, so long as it doesn't directly instigate violence. So you might remember back in Charlottesville, when a group of pathetic Oxford-wearing douche nozzles with tiki torches marched around chanting, Jews will not replace us. Totally protected. Yet if somebody had yelled out, kill the Jews, it's a gray area. And if a Jewish person is assaulted in response to that, that's when speech is criminalized. It's just not that complicated. Nor am I saying anything radical or controversial. What is pretty radical 
are the ways in which this moment is being interpreted through the mainstream media lens. So here's the hit piece, and I'm sorry to do it, but I think it's really important. Recently, I came across a clip of NYU professor, author, and podcast host Scott Galloway speaking with Michael Smirkonish on CNN. Now, again, I don't like hit pieces generally, and I find them unproductive, but the reason that this one stuck out to me, and it's so pointed, is because of the space that Galloway occupies in the larger media landscape, and the fact that it's on CNN, which is a pretty broad platform. So if you're not familiar with Galloway, he exists on the spectrum of modern-day white male social commentators that are called upon to analyze, at this point, literally any subject. And yes, I'm saying this with the full awareness that I'm a white male presenter who comments on multiple subjects, so let me dispense with the obvious. It's people like Galloway that provide a cautionary tale to keep people like me firmly in my lane. So like when I'm out of my depth, for example, we'll do a phone a friend. Otherwise, I do my best to examine topics from a political and socioeconomic perspective or provide insight on ancillary and related topics, but with copious amounts of research and a healthy amount of disclaimers. Now, Galloway is a very successful entrepreneur turned marketing professor at NYU who provides keen insight into brand building. Great. Today, he belongs in the pantheon of white male social commentators that come from a very specific background, but now find themselves offering commentary on a diverse range of subjects with the conviction of subject matter experts. So here's what that spectrum looks like. Andrew Huberman, Andrew Tate, Ben Shapiro, Dave Rubin, Steven Pinker, Sam Harris, Brett Weinstein, Jordan Peterson, Joe Rogan, Russell Brand, Gary Vaynerchuk, Dave Ramsey, Tony Robbins, Tim Poole, Steven Crowder, Piers Morgan, Tucker Carlson, Andrew Schultz, Charlie Kirk, Matt Walsh, and Douglas Murray, give or take. Now, some might think that Galloway doesn't belong on this list, but hang tight for the clips of his appearance. Now, you have adjacent commentators on the left, but what makes these guys different on the right is their tendency to lean into bro culture war topics, and they're independently platformed and untethered from the mainstream. So if you take like Bill Maher, for example, he's got HBO. Ezra Klein has the New York Times. Chris Cuomo has News Nation, if you consider that a media outlet. The point being, the other guys have built a cult of personality around their personal brands and lean into the set your alarm, make your bed, tan your balls, be an alpha, increase your testosterone bullshit that makes people hate people that look like me and make young men think that toxic behavior is the true mark of a man. But Galloway... Oh, he's just a warm glass of milk at bedtime compared to this spate of asshats. And I think that's why I had such a virulent reaction to his CNN appearance. So Galloway was given a prime time slot to address pro-Palestine protests on campuses like the one that he works on, despite the fact that, as one of our listeners pointed out, just days after the October 7th attacks by Hamas on Israeli citizens, Galloway said on his podcast, Pivot, that he didn't feel qualified to weigh in on the subject. Lo, these many months later, he's drawn some conclusions where protests are concerned, and you'll hear in these clips. We'll break his points down one by one to demonstrate how mainstream pundits divert our attention from the real matters at hand and manufacture consent with insidious tactics. So let's start with his opening remarks. Should USC have canceled its main graduation? Yeah, good to be with you, Michael. I, yeah, logistically, I, I think they, ha they have to ensure the safety, and it felt like things were getting kind of spinning out of control. So I empathize with university leadership that's trying to thread the needle between free speech while at the same time maintaining a safe environment for its students. I would argue, though, that the balance is a bit skewed. I think universities have slowly but surely decided that they're uh, more from centers of excellence to institutions that uh, create a political orthodoxy or are charged with social engineering. And what you have here, in my opinion, is a bit of a double standard, Michael. I think the vast majority of the protests are peaceful protests. You know, they're 19. They I cut a wide berth for young people and their rights to say things. But, uh, you know, the analogy I use, Michael, is if I went down to the plaza at NYU in a white hood and started saying Dylan Roof, the gentleman, uh, the young man who killed uh, seven uh, people at a black church in uh, Charleston. And I started saying globalize Dylan and um, held up a sign that said, it, you know, 
lynch the blacks, for example, or some sort of hate speech like that, I don't think there'd be a lot of nuance or context needed. I think I would never work in academia again. And if I started inciting the type of behavior where there was a harassment of any special interest group, uh, I believe that if it got out of control the, the way it has in some of these campuses, I think they'd call in the National Guard. Okay. So his response starts off pretty measured and practical, noting the difficult line that university administrators have to walk between honoring free speech and protecting students. But almost immediately, he diverts the conversation into making sweeping generalizations about the nature of higher education in this country, saying that they're no longer centers of excellence, rather they participate in social engineering. Hold that thought for a moment, because then he goes on to say that young people are basically stupid and don't understand the difference between protests very specifically, calling for their own institutions to divest their holdings from corporations that engage in war profiteering or do business directly with Israel's government, and calls to support Dylan Roof and to lynch black people. Then he finishes by saying it would be justified in certain cases to call in the National Guard. So let's unpack these one by one. First off, the implication behind the broad stroke of political orthodoxy and social engineering is that these institutions are brainwashing children with some radical leftist ideology. And we can make this leap because the specific protests that he's criticizing are all coming from young students that identify with the left. So let me ask you this. What about Brigham Young or Liberty University? How about Southern Methodist, Colorado Christian, Texas A&M, Dallas Baptist or Abilene Christian? Or the University of Alabama? University of Arkansas, University of Kentucky, University of Mississippi, Auburn, Texas Christian, George Fox University, Benedictine College, Oklahoma State, Cornerstone University, Moody Bible Institute, Hillsdale College, Ave Maria University? Or how about the mass gathering of young white male counter-protesters at Ole Miss, draped in MAGA gear and American flags, who did this? that kind of orthodoxy, or just the leftist orthodoxy that is asking for a ceasefire in Gaza and humanitarian aid. Now that's just a partial list of some of the most conservative colleges and universities in America that arguably now outnumber the last vestiges of truly liberal institutions. This is such a disingenuous equivocation, it's astonishing. The students in these protests understand the difference. The question is, Scott, do you? And the idea that these protests that he even acknowledges are mostly peaceful warrant the attention of the National Guard is horrifying, even if delivered in the dulcet tones of Galloway's cognitive dissonance. First of all, the NYPD is arguably one of the most heavily militarized domestic law enforcement agencies in the world. Furthermore, the only physical violence that has occurred on these campuses has been at the hands of the police. So unless he's calling for the National Guard to come in and detain members of the NYPD, I'm really not clear on what the fuck he's talking about. Not to mention, the National Guard has somewhat of a fraught history when activated on college campuses. And I think what a lot of Jews are concerned with is that it seems like free speech is never freer when it's hate speech directed at Jews. So I would argue the campus leadership has erred on the side of, quite frankly, being a little too lenient to individuals who, for whatever reason, correctly or incorrectly, it, it devolves into a motion that makes people feel unsafe. Okay. In a separate video, we'll talk more about anti-Semitic remarks and the danger of permissive language when it comes to the Jewish people specifically. But this clip once again highlights the notion that Galloway, as a talking head, is somehow a reputable proxy for an expert on free speech. So if he took this space to speak factually about the nuance of speech— on private versus public campuses, or simply protected speech under the Constitution, and then contextualize it with his own personal feelings, that may be at least respectable. But to simply say that speech is never freer when it's directed at the Jews implies that there's somehow a hierarchy of free speech. He then suggests that there should be harsher penalties applied to students that make people feel unsafe without speaking to the distinction between public and private institutions or protected speech versus speech that incites violence. Most importantly, so far in this interview, still no mention of what the students are actually calling out, such as divestment, the ongoing massacre in Gaza, discoveries of mass graves, targeted assassinations of doctors and journalists, 14,000 dead children in the Gaza Strip alone, thousands of unlawfully detained citizens in the West Bank, 
restriction of humanitarian aid into Gaza, illegal Israeli-backed settlements in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, U.S. funding and supply of Israel's war machine, or our lone votes to strike down international ceasefire declarations in the U.N. Security Council. Uh, the bottom line is, Michael, I, uh, a lot of us just don't understand that uh, a young Jewish girl leaving the library to go get a manicure is somehow their mortal enemy. I think I think young people, quite frankly, uh, pick the wrong enemy here, and it's just gotten a little bit out of control. Okay, this goes back to what I was saying in the beginning about selectivity. Galloway chooses to depict the experience of a young Jewish girl going to get a manicure being harassed by protesters as the part that is, quote, out of control, rather than the overwhelming amount of footage of police brutality against peaceful protesters. First off, I googled my little heart out to find out what the fuck he's even talking about, but maybe he just made this up because I couldn't find it. And that's fucking bizarre in its own right because there are genuine examples of hateful anti-Semitic rhetoric to be found along with online threats that are pervasive. But the protests have been extremely careful to root out this kind of behavior. So he could have chosen to celebrate the Passover Seder at the Columbia University encampment in solidarity among Jewish and Muslim students who observed Seder, by the way, alongside faculty members. But he didn't. Instead, he defaulted to what is itself an anti-Semitic trope about a Jewish girl on her way to get a fucking manicure. Well, there's some strange things. I went to the NYU protest. 40% 40, 40 of the tents were the same tents at Columbia. So there's something very coordinated going, around, uh, going on. I think it's a variety of few things. One, uh, I think that a lot of students incorrectly, in my view, conflate what's going on in Gaza with the civil rights movement. Two, we have not done a great job, in, or we in colleges have created this oppressor and oppressed orthodoxy. And the easiest way to identify an oppressor in the minds of many of these young people is how white and how rich you are. And ground zero, correctly or incorrectly, for whiteness and richness is Israel and Jews. Also, just to be fair, Israel has not draped itself in glory. Uh, Netanyahu has struck some deals with the far right, including very bigoted members of the Knesset, over settlements. We've gone, uh, we've seen Israel go from kind of the David to the Goliath. 40% of the tents at NYU were the same as the ones at Columbia? Really? Is that a hard number, Scott? It didn't have anything to do with the style of cheap tent being the most readily available on Amazon? Now, John Oliver destroyed this better than I could, so I'll leave that to him. But a word on the idea of coordination and his gish gallop retorts. Students conflate Gaza with the civil rights movement? How? Because they're protesting on a campus? The Vietnam War, Iraq War, South African apartheid, the Women's March, climate justice, overturning Roe v. Wade, each of these had campus movements as well. Were these students also confused? This argument makes no sense on its face, and it's intended to minimize their grievances, basically telling them that my generation fought for real stuff. He then moves on to cynically downplay the idea that schools are only teaching history through the lens of oppressor and oppress, or as I like to call it, history. Once again, this has literally nothing to do with the calls to divest from the war machine or a call for a ceasefire to end the massacre. And if it did, what exactly is wrong with viewing political systems through the lens of oppression? Would you prefer it through the lens of capitalism and markets? Corporate brands? That is, after all, your wheelhouse, Scott. So I can only assume that that's your preferred learning journey. Also, the idea that ground zero for oppression is whiteness and richness, and therefore that applies to Israel alone, is galling. The United States is ground zero for whiteness, richness, and oppression. It's a matter of modern historical record as well that colonial oppression and occupations from the U.S. exploits in Latin America and the Caribbean, the British in India, Israel and Palestine, the French in Algeria, the Dutch in South Africa, were steeped in racist orthodoxy. But more recent movements have also aligned against Russian aggression, China's treatment of Uyghurs and other religious minorities, Hindu leadership treatment of Muslims in India, women's rights in Islamic fundamentalist regimes, and civil war in Sudan. So the common thread here is, in fact, Scott, oppressor versus oppressed narratives. To refer to Israel's occupation of Palestine as ground zero for richness and whiteness is cynical, erroneous, and frankly patronizing. Now, as for Netanyahu striking deals with the far right being the only objectionable thing that he's done, I have no words. Actually, I have a few. 
First off, the far-right extremists that Netanyahu is conveniently aligned with aren't analogous to anything in the United States, at least not formally. To equate the far-right party in Israel, called the Otzma Yehudit, with anything in the United States, you would have to look outside of the political realm to unearth some hate group on the terror watch list. The difference is that Otzma Yehudit is an organized political movement in power and is composed of ethnic nationalists who openly promote ethnic cleansing of Palestinians and also condemnation of Orthodox and secular Jews in Israel. Israeli Finance Minister Smotrich has openly, consistently, and very recently called for the annihilation of all Gazans. And lest we forget that Ben Gavir, the head of national security in Israel, was linked to the far-right nationalist group that assassinated Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, and also openly calls for the annihilation of all Gazans. Netanyahu didn't just strike a deal to stay in power. He made a deal with the devil. There's a difference. Finally, let's listen to what Galloway thinks is really motivating young people to take to the streets in protest of genocide. And here's where he moves from ill-informed propagandist to outright bro culture lunacy. Wait for it. You'll be amazed. Finally, I think there's something bigger going on, Michael. I think that the you have young people who are enraged by the lack of opportunity that they're presented with. I think that protesting is kind of the new, if you will, sex. Young people aren't having as much sex. I know how ridiculous that sounds, but for the species to survive, you have to have young people connecting um, uh, uh, in terms of romantic opportunities. And also for the species to survive, you get a dope a hit from gathering together and fighting off a perceived enemy. And I think they're erring on the ladder, if you will. I think they're on the hunt for what I'd call a fake mortal enemy. And the reality is if you type in to Google anti-Semitism and pick any century in the last 3,000 years, you're going to find multiple instances where the world uh, decides the Jews are the mortal enemy. And then finally, and I know this sounds paranoid, but it doesn't mean, mean I'm wrong, the frame through which they view the world is oftentimes or predominantly TikTok. And on TikTok, Michael, there are 52 pro-Hamas videos for every one pro-Israel video. So the frame through which they see the world is, um, in my opinion, being influenced to sow division and chaos uh, within America and divide young from old. 80% of people our age support Israel. It's 20% of people under the age of 25. Something's going on here. Oh, something's going on here, all right. Your fucking brain is detached from reality. That's what's going on. Brother. I have a kid in college. You work at a college. Kids are fucking their brains out today. But somehow, Galloway has determined that college kids aren't fucking enough. And therefore, the only way they can get their rocks off is by protesting genocide? Dude, what the actual fuck? This is the narrative of incels and nerds like Matt Walsh and Tucker Carlson who literally advocate for ultraviolet ball tanning to increase testosterone because men these days are weak and would rather sit at home gaming than fucking. I mean, maybe that's what's going on with some incel like Tucker somewhere stuck in their parents' basement working a menial job and jacking off to Andrew Tate videos, but I can assure you that college students at Columbia, NYU, USC, and everywhere else are fucking their brains out. Well, maybe not at Brigham. But let's play this one part again, because I want you to focus on the transition. If ever there was an example of bad faith propaganda, this is it. Young people aren't having as much sex. I know how ridiculous that sounds, but for the species to survive, you have to have young people connecting um, uh, uh, in terms of romantic opportunities. And also for the species to survive, you get a dope a hit from gathering together and fighting off a perceived enemy. And I think they're erring on the ladder, if you will. I think they're on the hunt for what I'd call a fake mortal enemy. And the reality is if you type in to Google anti-Semitism and pick any century in the last 3,000 years, you're going to find multiple instances where the world uh, decides the Jews are the mortal enemy. Galloway somehow seamlessly connects the students aren't fucking enough so they're looking for someone to blame narrative to every example throughout history when Jews were persecuted and oppressed. So does that mean when Catherine the Great banished Jews in Eastern Europe to the Pale of Settlement, it's because she wasn't getting enough of that good dick? When Visigoths expelled Sephardic Jews from Spain, it's because there wasn't enough poontang in the Catholic Church to go around? That when the Nazi party scapegoated the Jews in Germany, they were just horny. If anyone in these analogies should be fucking, it's Scott Galloway going to fuck himself. Finally, he lands on blaming TikTok. Not social media writ large, not the mainstream media, not even Israel. TikTok. 
Even though thoroughly debunked, he taps into yet another old white person fear that China is somehow manipulating Americans into sympathizing with Palestine and rebuking Israel over its prosecution of the war. Not to mention the fact that the only way the images can escape Gaza is via social media like TikTok because there is a complete media blackout because Israel won't allow any foreign outlets into Gaza. Or how the ratio, even though he's making it up, would theoretically track because it mirrors the ratio of deaths between Palestinians and Israelis since October 7th. Just that young people shouldn't believe their lying eyes. Every mass student protest, of which, once again, this is one of the smallest, every single one of them has been on the right side of history and opposed in the moment by people who look and think a lot like Scott Galloway. Free speech sit-ins in the 60s against McCarthyist policies and communist witch hunts. Anti-Vietnam protests in the 60s and 70s. Bra-burning feminist rights marches. Pride demonstrations. Racial injustice protests like the one at Jackson State College where the student body was fired upon by the cops, leaving two dead and 12 more injured. South African apartheid demonstrations in the 80s. Black Lives Matter. All on the right side of history and the wrong side of mediocre, old, white establishment dickheads. In the next video, I'm going to have a little conversation with fellow leftists about anti-Semitism. Just because criticisms of Israel and the far-right extremists that have hijacked the country are just and valid, doesn't mean anti-Semitism isn't on the rise. Here's to staying in lanes, doing the work, and listening. Take care.